Okay, so this morning our topic is a continuation of practicing self-nurturance, but I'm going to infuse it with more Ayurveda. Richard is here to help us with that. And then we're going to talk a little more deeply about how, what are the, what are the structures of self-empathy. It's a concept, but a concept isn't that helpful if there isn't a practical way to apply it. And Jay is also here for helping us with that part of our discussion. As always, I like to sit in silence to start us, so I'm going to ring this bell. And as it goes to silence, we will do the same. For this particular quiet time that we'll share, I'm going to give a few bits of guidance. And so first, taking a seat that's relatively upright and relatively relaxed. Bring your awareness to the experience you have of your breath at this moment. without having to modify or manipulate your breath in any way, come to notice that your breath is breathing you. And there is only required a kind of quiet participation, appreciation. without having to modify your breath in any way, bring some kind attention now to the base of your brain, the brain stem, also called your reptilian brain, also called your lizard brain. You might imagine it as a place at the base of your skull, just above the top of the neck in this region, generally recall the brainstem. And to this part of your brain, you can say, right now, you are safe. Right now you are safe. The lizard brain is responsible for all things housekeeping and homeostasis. Body temperature, brain chemistry, heart rate, respiration, 
hunger and satiation. And so to the lizard brain, you can say, thank you. Right now, you are safe. And then you may quietly bring your awareness to what's called the middle brain, also called your limbic brain, or your mammalian brain. Think of it as in the middle of your head. I also like to call it your dog and cat brain. It is the part of your brain that seeks connection and scans for safety or danger in connection. The dog and cat brain, your limbic brain, is where you'll sense emotions surge from, and when detecting threat or danger, you'll go into your particular neurological and physiological patterns. So right now, to the dog and cat brain, you can say also, you're safe and you're resourced. Your basic needs have been met. And there's not at this moment any particular threat or danger. You are relatively safe and relatively resourced. And also for your dog and cat brain, you can say, and you are connected. At this moment, you are connected and interconnected. Bring your awareness to the front of your brain, also sometimes called the neocortex. In this region, we have our capacity for a sense of self, empathy, perspective, context, wisdom. You can imagine from this part of your brain that you're able to have what we call the wider view. And so to these parts of your brain, you can say, you are safe, you are resourced, your basic needs have been met, you are connected and interconnected, and that your awakening matters. And with that in your awareness, please bring your palms together in Anjali Mudra. And 
and you may bow your head to your heart. Release your hands and open your eyes. And so we're going to have a few moments to hear from you how was your experience of the meditation. And we'll be more topic-centered after that. Yes? I felt like I could really sense the different areas in my brain and really like be in those places. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed the, the words. Mm. Like I felt like my brain tissue was absorbing oh. the words. That's very nutritious. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Thank you. What else did you experience? I felt like um, I was in a as, as you were speaking those words, I was able to take it in. And when we got to the middle part, I just felt this huge relief. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's so nice. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lisa? Um, When I was thinking (laughs) during the meditation, um, it, it, um, you know, inadvertently, of course, um, the thought came to me that we have this brain, this memory from past lives or from past experiences, and I was wondering, where does that reside? You know, Mm -hmm. that is, like, which part of the brain? Then I came back to meditation, but... Would you like me to answer your question? I would. <laughs> would you agree with me if I said the hippocampus? And the part? Hippocampus. Yeah. yeah. For, what was it? I For memory. For memory. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the middle brain. I'm just checking. Sometimes, I think I said this yesterday, now that I'm wearing reading glasses, my spelling has changed, so has my handwriting. And now that I can't hear, my memory is actually a little bit affected, so having some trouble with word finding. It's your hippocampus. Your memory is stored in your hippocampus. Is that helpful? Yeah. <laughs> do you know where that is? <laughs> well, I mean, I know it's in the middle brain now. It is, yeah. yeah. So you do know. Yeah, it's in your middle brain. It's in your dog and cat brain that you have memory. From, like, from the community's past. Well, I don't know if I can speak about your past lives. I have no personal direct experience with past lives or anybody else's past lives. I do know that the hippocampus is kind of like, I described like a slide projector, tossing up certain slides and images for you in a flicker. I mean, it it comes without your consent. A little flicker of memory comes up. And some of that is likely intergenerational and wordless. So the right hemisphere of the brain doesn't have a language center and it's storing the pre-verbal experiences and our wordless experiences. For some of us, when we have a a shocking event or a sudden fear event, a trauma event, we lose our words. Quite literally, the left language center in the brain can shut down. You can see it in different MRI uh, reports. And the person is having a wordless experience of terror. There might be images in there, and there's certainly a body response, a body memory of it. Then the left side of the brain, when it has memory, also can apply a narrative to it. And sometimes our narrative doesn't make any sense to the people who were actually there in the same experience. Like our narrative is, that person didn't like me very much. And their narrative is, they had the stomach flu all weekend. right? (laughs) So the, the narrative that you get with some of your memories isn't always accurate. Yeah. Yes? The amygdala, is that in the stem? It's in the middle brain. The amygdala and the hippocampus are working in tandem. So your amygdala is like your smoke detector, as Bessel van der Kolk calls it. It's, it's that which is looking for the danger, it's looking for the threat instead of scanning, and it's giving you the moment-to-moment report. Mm-hmm. And the hippocampus will push up a slide to make sure that if there is a little hunch, there's a a corresponding reason why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a mess that could be, huh? (laughs) It can become messy. Yeah. Yeah. So one reason that I started with talking about your brain this morning in this meditation is that in the asana class, I said to you as a group of practitioners that how we learned to care for our vitality 
which you might call your physiology before today, but now you're going to call it your vitality. How you learn to care for your vitality was in the company of others. How they responded to you with your physiological needs, with your temperament, with your dosha, with their dosha, with their temperament, with their physiological needs. You learned it in tandem with other people. And therefore, if we know that part of how we are responding to our vitality is actually a brain-centered activity, even though we have wisdom coming from the neocortex, we have a lot of strong implicit memory and dog and cat memories in there telling us how to care for ourselves at any one moment. And sometimes that message is chocolate cake. And sometimes it's snooze, you push the snooze button. And sometimes it's red wine with breakfast. <laughs> and sometimes it's run 20 miles a day. And sometimes it's hot yoga three times a day. And like that, what, what's being said, like specifically, may be changing. You know, hot yoga three times a day, you probably didn't say that when you were in the second grade. You might have said chocolate cake in the second grade. You probably didn't say red wine with breakfast when you were in the fifth grade. But you might have said something like, I need a treat. So that whole milieu, it might have a changing storyline, but the behind the scenes sort of like temperament and conditioning is important for us to know. And one way to know something is when you start to act a little bit in contrast to your habits. So for example, if you start applying the Ayurvedic recommendations to your life, that will very much nourish your brain. And it's probably just out of step with how you were conditioned or greatly out of step with how you were conditioned. Like in my case, it was greatly out of step with my conditioning when I started looking into Ayurveda. I was like, walk more slowly and then even more slowly. <laughs> <laughs> and then Richard told me to eat my biggest meal in the middle of the day. I was like, oh no, no. What you do is you wait all day to spare your calories and then have the calories at dinner. <laughs> and you have calories with dessert. No, not in the middle of the day. Or do less. I was like, do less? That's for other people. No, I'm actually required to do more and to figure out how to do it more efficiently and effectively on behalf of just about everybody else except for myself. So when Ayurveda came into my world, it was not just a little out of step, it was greatly out of step with my conditioning. And in that tug between those things, we, we are practicing we are having revealed to us. We are having discoveries. We are practicing the yoga of paying attention to that. And we're learning about self-nurturing discipline, the discipline to nurture your vitality, not the discipline to keep doing what you've been doing. That requires a lot less discipline. Even if some of your particular habits right now seem like they require great discipline of you, Hypothetically, not doing it would require more discipline. An example that I often use because I work with people who have food addiction issues, an example that I often use is, okay, so you binged, and now you're not allowed to punish yourself for it. You're not allowed to make up for it. I don't want you going to purging or laxatives or compulsive exercise or compulsive <laughs> restricting. Okay, you, you did the thing. Now, your next action in your habit pattern, you think that takes a lot of discipline to, to do the restricting or to do the compulsive exercising. It actually takes little to no discipline at all because they've done it for so many times. That the self-nurturing discipline is not doing those things that are making up for the badness that you just were a few moments ago when you were binging. Do you understand what I mean by this? I'm just going to pause for a moment and say that all five senses have experiences of the present moment and we can consider them painful or non-painful, likable or unlikable, desirable or non-desirable. We can also think of them as neutral. So let's consider this fragrance neutral. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a distraction. I thought it was burnt toast. It's probably not. <laughs> burnt toast would be a, a kind of fun translation for me, but cigarette smoke is a less fun translation, so we can practice neutral relationship towards sensation right now. 
Okay, so what, of, what I had to say there is stimulating reflections or questions for you or contributions from either Richard or from Jay also. I find it fascinating because I'm sure all of us in this room have expressed our lifestyle to someone at some time in the life and they go, oh, that's amazing. And you're like, no, it's really not enough. I just, you know, I just need to do more. And it's not even hard for me anymore, but what I really need to do is more. Mm-hmm. And what you're saying is putting the spotlight on that. It doesn't actually, it doesn't strengthen any muscle, it, so mm-hmm. to speak, muscle, but to not do would be yeah. really hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somebody might feel impressed with the um, discipline in your life to do yoga and eat well and exercise well and hydrate and, you know, so on. And that's impressive to them, but to the part of you that says do more or try more or um, do it harder, what you're currently doing won't be enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a good realization. Mm-hmm. I have a, uh, a sharing about how the narratives don't always match the situation. And uh, when I first met Sarah Joy and told her all about Ayurveda, and then she kind of went away from my life. Um, my narrative was she doesn't like me anymore. Mm. And uh, several years ago, you kind of shared with me some of the narrative Mm. that was going on with her. And it was... It was uh, just mind-blowing, you know. I was just like, it It really, uh, I don't know what the word was, but it really impacted me. Mm. And it was not anything like my narrative. Mm-hmm. so often the case, right? Yeah, like most of the time. (laughs) (laughs) When we learn that enough, we hope that we remember it when it's happening, but the dog and cat that are searching for connection and that perceive a threat to connection, they're very highly activated. Remembering that the narrative may not be congruent with our narrative, that comes from your neocortex, from having context and perspective and a, a bigger vision. If your, your dog and cat don't have, that part of your brain doesn't have the same capacity. It has a different memory storehouse. It's not about remembering. It's just about memory, 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 memory. Flashes of what's going on here. Sometimes not so helpful in their flashes. I think much of the time that people aren't even aware that they do have a narrative running. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that uh, it's just playing out your role in the narrative, but not being aware that there is a narrative that you're, or that you're playing a role. It's, it's just what you're doing. This is how it is. This is the way I feel. And those, so and the narrative being literally a, a language um, goes back to the left and right hemisphere thing that many of the the implicit memories create a narrative that is not verbal and so we're living it without really having words and uh, there's an interesting uh, line of thinking that I heard recently that talks about the relationship we have to the words that as soon as we have a word for something it changes our relationship to it Mm -hmm. and the way I think of that is that it gives us an opportunity to do something with it prior to that we're just experiencing it and it's almost as if we need a more clear sense of it to to work with it, so mm-hmm. to speak. And it takes a lot of uh, introspection and insight to mm-hmm. to be able to frame it, to be able to become aware of it, create a frame for it, and decide what you're going to do with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to have the brain more optimally functioning 
is going to be a better asset for us. When your brain is under-resourced, there were reasons why I said in this meditation very specifically, you are safe, you are resourced, that means your basic needs have been met, you are connected, you are interconnected, and your awakening matters. This is like a mantra of sorts. So if the brain doesn't know that it's right now safe, it's in charge of keeping you safe. So if your brain interprets that you're not safe, it will have to escalate the biochemistry to move you to safety. If your brain is under-resourced, so that means you don't have the best nutrition on board, there are certain nutrients your brain actually needs to function better. Maybe you're not very well hydrated. Maybe you're not oxygenated. You haven't been breathing very well. Maybe you don't exhale that much, so you have an excess of CO2 in your system. And so if your brain is under-resourced or interprets danger or not safety, it's very hard to do what Jay was just referring to. You might have the life value coming from the neocortex here of, I want to inquire into my experiences. I value curiosity and empathy and kindness. But when the brain itself is actually under-resourced, those are values, not lived expressions. Have you had this experience as a person? Mm -hmm. What happens when you're not able to live your values? What do you then say to yourself? There's something wrong with me. Yeah, there's something wrong with me. Does that, do you think that improves your brain chemistry? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you think maybe the lizard and the dog and the cat get more activated? Yeah. To, yeah. It spirals down more. Yeah, yeah. What else happens when you realize you're not, at that moment, able to live your values? What do you say to yourself, in addition to what Carolyn said? Gotta try harder. I should try harder. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> I should quit. Uh -huh. I, should, that, that, I should quit this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's have some ice cream. <laughs> so she says we're going to try harder, and you said we're going to quit. Yeah, so ice cream is a good way to quit. Yeah. <laughs> Forget it, this isn't working. So I'm Richard, would those be tied in with the doshas or the imbalances in the doshas then? Because that's two mm -hmm. pretty different approaches. Um, yeah, I mean, what, we, what, what are comfort foods? Mm -hmm. Sweet. What pacifies vata? Sweetness. Mm -hmm. Sweet, salt, and sour. So pickles and ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very seldom do you eat lettuce when you're depressed <laughs> but it actually works great you know? it really does um, because it brings some freshness and, but uh, yeah, it doesn't, it, not in the moment, you want sweet, because mm -hmm. you don't have enough sweetness in your life. You want mm -hmm. sour, because you're not voicing your anger. Mm -hmm. you know, you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Elaine. Um, can you repeat again, with the, um, the brain stem, the healing... There, you said you know, meditation is you're safe. You are safe. And then yeah. for the midbrain, you are resourced. You're resourced. And you're, and resourced. you're connected. And then what was for the neocortex? You're interconnected. Oh, that's you're interconnected. Mm -hmm. But the midbrain is you're connected. Yeah, because the dog and cat are seeking connection. Okay, and the interconnected is something that the neocortex can understand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then also your awakening matters. So. You're awake. Your awakening matters. Like you're, like looking at seeing what's You coming happening. into consciousness matters. Okay. Thank you, you realizing your indwelling love or presence, it matters. Okay. Mm -hmm. That yeah. really spoke to me. That really felt like yeah. it's worth it. Whatever this moment is bringing, it's okay. Because there's something that's happening that's in the big picture. Yeah. 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 The big picture is happening from here, right? Not from the lizard. He has the lizard part of your brain. He or she has very little big picture interest or capacity. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I'm just curious. Maybe you'll cover it for a minute. But um, 
So I think like as yoga practitioners, we get really good at watching what's happening. Like it's a virtual reality in our brain, right? So I've gotten really good at that over the years. But then um, something happens. Like someone's actually like, say, is being really mean to me. Mm -hmm. I have like hurt and you know, my first inclination is to blame me. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, well, that's sort of not the point. <laughs> but, notice how it wants I, to sneak in there, though, right? What? Just notice how that wants to sneak in there. It did, yeah. Perhaps that part of you needs some empathy, and this was a j good chance for it to say, oh. because you have companions in the room, so it sneaks in to make sure that we know that it's a part of you that might have some needs. Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is, like, I've gotten to this place along my journey where I don't react, but I get stuck in non-reactiveness. Mm -hmm. So somebody's rude to me, it's really easy for me to see that it's not much, you know, mm -hmm. but where do I go from there? I don't want to be the doormat. I don't want to be, and I get stuck in the confusion. Like, I will sit on it for 24 hours like a really mm -hmm. responsible person. And then I'll like lay on it for like a week. <laughs> yeah, for months. And it's like, I need to stick up for me or I need to. Yeah. I'm just curious about it. It's been mm -hmm. bothering me. So. Yeah, so I, I experienced this question, this um, commentary, a little bit like when you, you're driving to Brighton Bush Hot Springs and on the side of the road is the fire danger sign and it has um, green and then a lighter green and then a yellow green and then a yellow and then a yellow, orange, orange, red. So it's like, it's on a gradation. Where are we? Are we green, no danger of fire? Are we red, all danger of fire, no campfires allowed? So on a gradation like this. What I heard you say is, you used to react. Like, you would go into hurt. Yes. And whatever your reaction pattern might be, let's call that the red part. In fact, we used to say things like, seeing red. Right? When somebody would get angry, they would say, oh, I'm seeing red. So you're over here in your reaction. And then you've learned how to be more neutral and non-reactive. So you're somewhere near the orange-yellow. We're not in the same danger of fire, but we're not really out of the woods yet because now you're lying around for a week on the non-reactive, <laughs> <laughs> like, little stuck position. I have a text I need to send that I have not sent yet. Uh -huh. In response to someone that's been there for 24 hours now. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. That's probably wise action right now. In fact, I like to counsel my students and myself as well that if my brain doesn't feel cohesive, if, if I don't feel it in my nervous system as a good moment to respond, then I don't. So you know what happens for me is, so I don't, I go, I don't go into reacting angrily. That's not me. Mm -hmm. But as I, I notice this process of growing, Anger actually fuels me to do wise action. So sometimes if I'm really fired up, it's the time to do it, not mm -hmm. to wait. So I get confused. Sometimes that fire can be motivating. Right? Yeah. Um, what I was going to suggest about this sort of yellow, orange, moving towards green place is that when, you're, when your brain feels like it's a yes, we can start considering not reacting or non-reacting or like pseudo-neutral non-reacting, but self-empathy. And that might be a really important stage for you to explore before you go to other forgiveness or even other communication, mm. to come into self-empathy, like okay. for the experience of feeling hurt or overwhelmed or disconnected. I go to annoyance at myself for that, because I see it. I see my patterns, so I go to annoyance. So empathy oh. would be a really good thing. Yeah, annoyance for your pattern isn't likely to help the pattern to change. I know. <laughs> So maybe when annoyance emerges, that's where you say, I see you, to your annoyance. It's coming for a reason. It thinks it's part of your protective strategy, protecting you from hurt, perhaps. But a protective strategy can become a preventive strategy because it can block you from then moving to the next stage, which for you I would be recommending self-empathy. Wow, look at how I go to annoyance. Look at how I might have learned this for decades, to go to annoyance. You're not trying to make yourself safe because of what other people's needs are. 
Yeah. So empathy for that, you can also say to your annoyance, if you're willing to, you can say, thank you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for showing up because you might be telling me that my brain is under-resourced and I just got triggered. And thank you for showing up because if you're not here, I can't work on what you are as a pattern in my life. So I'm so glad you came to visit. So let's talk for a few moments about what I call dashboarding, and then we'll talk about Dinacharya, which is the Ayurvedic routine for life. And I'm pointing us to this because, again, I said that sometimes our brains are really under-resourced, and it's hard to even navigate a question like what Carrie's asking of herself. It's, it's hard to know how to do that most well if your brain is overwhelmed and under-resourced. So when I say dashboarding, which I made into a verb, I think, is that a verb? Dashboarding it is a verb. It's a verb, yeah, actually. You turned it into an action, yeah. I turned it into an action, yeah. The dashboard, the body dashboard, as I like to say, has seven daily essentials on it. And if those aren't a part of your uh, self-nurturance practice now, I would be recommending that they are. So dashboarding is the act of doing those things. And those things include hydration, that's probably the easiest one to start with if you need to start somewhere because it's pretty neutral to hydrate your body. Though for some people that means giving up Coke, coffee, lessening how much alcohol because those, those substances are dehydrating. So it's not just increasing water, it's decreasing what dehydrates you as well. Also keeping your blood sugar balanced not helpful to let yourself get too hungry or to have your blood sugar go offline, either escalating or de-escalating. And it's not helpful to have that happen consistently enough where you then have to keep recovering your blood sugar. We were talking to somebody at Brighton Bush Hot Springs who came to our yoga and love retreat and she said sometimes she doesn't realize until 3 o'clock in the afternoon that she hasn't eaten anything and she has a 315 meeting across town. So she's going to eat a power bar in the car while she goes there. Forgetting to have food until 3 o'clock in the afternoon is not a natural state. It's not native to the human body to do that. It's a learned behavior for her. And she's prioritizing getting things done over nourishing her body. Like just the basics. Also, eating in the car is not digesting what you've taken in because you can't your body has to decide between using the brain for navigating something like your computer your car traffic or digesting food so distracted eating doesn't lead to digestion so yeah. this person's blood sugar has to recover a lot Go ahead. so yeah and the power bar would be the worst possible choice mm -hmm. to, to, to like because there's you know it's got proteins and fats and complex carbohydrates in it, which are difficult to digest. Mm -hmm. The most intelligent thing would be a half of an apple, which has plenty of sugar, but it's very easy to digest and it's natural. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not a whole apple, <laughs> just half. Yeah. And that person, however, who at 3 o'clock is so hungry they and distracted and overwhelmed, they could eat their own arm off. Right. The half apple doesn't feel like a good idea to them. But the, the problem actually isn't 3 o'clock. The yeah. issue started back earlier in the day, and it started back earlier in the weeks and months and years of habit. So the, the second item on the dashboard is about keeping your blood sugar balanced. We also have maintaining and nourishing your deep rest so your sleep cycle, but also that you have mental rest regularly enough in the course of your day that you don't just feel like you've got the accelerator down all day and then you go for the break at night. We live in a Western culture that really heavily emphasizes that mechanism. Mm -hmm. You go to India, you're waiting on line outside the ashram, in southern India where it's 100 degrees, people are wearing full saris if they're women and the men are wearing the equivalent traditional clothing. 
and you get there and you're like eager to go into the ashram to see the extraordinary inside and hundreds of Indians are napping on the cement platform near the ashram at two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, they're actually like so relaxed that they're just lying there in whatever, it almost looks like whatever position they fell down in, <laughs> there they are <laughs> napping. Whoa, like this is a whole culture of nappers here and the Westerners are online in the hot sun. These guys are napping in the shade. <laughs> <laughs> and what I noticed is that there, there's some part of each body that's touching another yes, body. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. They're all connected, uh -huh. literally. You know. mm -hmm. It's not just the people either. There's yeah. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dogs and puppies laying about. Right now, everywhere yeah. You look. <laughs> yeah, we didn't see too many cats this time. Okay. I should not diverge into the absence of cats in India. <laughs> so deep rest, balancing your blood sugar, hydrating, also having your heart rate go up like cardiovascularly about 20 minutes a day on a daily basis. It doesn't have to be your peak exercise. I'm not, we're not talking about getting ready for an athletic event, but kind of like cleaning the pipes, right? So breathing more heavily, getting the oxygen, CO2 moving, circulation, getting the lymph system moving, you know, asking the garbage recycling and yard debris people to come and do that cleansing in your circulatory lymph and respiratory system, about 20 minutes a day. And also having daily, multiple times a day, chance for right brain activities. This might elude you as, how could that be a part of the body dashboard, but your right brain, you live in a left brain shifted world. And your right brain is so essential for experiences like awe, delight, and basking that you want to nurture that by giving yourself those either momentary lucid timeouts or formally sitting down for meditation for a few minutes or having a way to lean into your creativity or your imagination, not daydreaming senselessly, but like creativity, gardening, for example finger painting, whatever that activity might be for you. Is playing music from written music being that category, or is it more like free-form music? Improvisational music is more nourishing to the right brain, but music at all is helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Music for competition is different, which is how I was trained to, when I played the trumpet. <laughs> I competed with my trumpet. Just going into nature. Yeah, nature, yeah, yeah. Which is another uh, of the dashboard items. Actually having the air against your skin, like knowing that the natural world and you are not separate. Sometimes a person can actually walk into nature from where they are, or they have a garden in their backyard. And some of our students live in prison, they can't walk out into nature. They might walk out into the yard at some point in the day, or they might not if, they're, if they have a certain structure to their sentence. But they can see the light changing through a window in the cell, or they might be able to see a plant form somewhere. So then they're communing with that. It might sound minimalistic, but it is in their circumstances. So you make use of what you have. For some of my students on the East Coast, they live in high-rises with apartments and they don't have a garden and the windows don't open and they say oh I can't practice being in nature well why don't you buy a house plant <laughs> just buy several house plants so I I skype with this one young woman whose eating disorder is um, pretty long-lived and very strong for her but she showed me her house plant once I was very enamored to see her house plant during the Skype she actually picked it up and showed me here's the house plant I was so excited for her to have a house plant right just because we want to be reminded that this whole thing, this whole organism, floppy or not as it might seem to be, the whole thing is an expression of nature. We aren't here to rule nature. We aren't here, like in some world views, to make use of the resources of nature and then, and then die. We are here as a result of nature and we, we give ourselves back to the natural world when we die. So let's on a daily basis remember that thing that is the natural world. And sometimes take a bigger sojourn into nature. 
go to the ancient forest or the ocean or the mountaintop. And then another of the um, dashboard items is called elimination, which means on a daily basis, being able to have the obvious eliminatory pathways that is needs to be said, or do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you know, if you travel with us internationally, you will talk about poop. <laughs> People do. Didn't that happen, Lisa? Yeah. Or they'll talk about not pooping. Or they'll talk yeah. about pooping too fast, right? Because <laughs> you're in India, and it's all different. Like, even if we go to Mexico, sometimes people have to talk about their poop. So, And Ayurveda asks about your poop, so we might as well be comfortable talking more about it. But no, the elimination is the obvious, but also sweating. So your lymph system and your skin are part of, it's the biggest immune organ that you have, the skin. And daily laughing and daily crying. I really recommend this last part, the daily crying. Mm. I think both Jay and Tristan know that I, I sometimes hunt down on the internet more videos for crying. They're like celebratory videos. It's a video where you see the human spirit coming through or you see a certain tenderness from one person to another and this causes the tears to come. I don't recommend getting lost on the internet for hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes this happens to me that I'm, I'm on the YouTube it's called an app on my phone, and I can see the next, they're going to give me the next video, and the next video, and the next one. At a certain point, that's not nourishing your dashboard. It's draining your resources, so you have to do it in moderation. I think I, did you get six or seven? Seven? Oh, then I'm done. How oh, nice. So let's say that you were to take on any one of those, or you can start with one and add another and so on, you will automatically be practicing the art of self-nurturing discipline and you will also automatically be challenging whatever your conditioning was. You will walk right into it. You don't have to go back and historically figure out what your conditioning was. Your conditioning is already with you here and now. Your friends can probably tell you what it is. Your therapist may be able to tell you what it is. But as you endeavor to this kind of self-care, you will also discover what that is, what that conditioning has been. I'd like to spend a, a short time now on the Ayurvedic clock because it's another way of looking at how could you bring your vitality into most optimal functioning. I know Richard has this memorized, but he hasn't seen my handout about it, so I'll leave this here for you. Here's some handouts for you guys. Would you like to talk about it? Some? Go ahead. You know, I'm, I'm really enjoying this thing to you. Okay. So, see what you say. You're, you're, uh, you have a different way to explain it. That's great. So in the Ayurvedic clock, because I talk with people about this on a regular basis, I have a few specific places where I make uh, very strong recommendations. But the clock is showing us that in the course of a day, in the course of 24 hours, we live through the cycles of the three doshas twice. So your early morning vata dosha is 2 a.m. to 6 a.m at the equator at equinox, so you have to adjust for what's happening now. The most important part of that vata cycle in the day is for auspiciousness, quietude, pranayama, meditation, communing with nature. In yoga practice, in this window of the day, they are practicing arti, A-R-T-I. It means the celebration of the light, because the light is changing, it's going from darkness to light. So we practice arti, we practice chanting, singing, giving gratitude, there's fire ceremony, there's water in the ceremony, there's some pranayama and there's meditation. This is the auspicious activity of the vata time of day. 
One of the places that I make a really strong recommendation to my students is here. In the Vata time of day, I'm recommending that you wake up with sunrise, if not before sunrise. Just as the sun is coming, that you're also waking up. Please don't push back on that just yet. Let me, <laughs> let me come around. <laughs> Following the Vata period of the early morning, we have the Kapha part of morning. 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. And here the morning gets a little heavier because kapha is more unctuous, more earth and water grounded, a little slower moving. If you sleep into this period, you can wake up feeling more sluggish, not more alert, not more like the, the lightness of vata or the, that light tingle of the early morning sun. So between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m., a recommendation, though it's not one of my top three, it comes after the top three, um, here I would recommend some vigorous exercise. For one person, that might be a brisk walk around the block once. But for somebody else, it could be like, I enjoy bike commuting at that time of day. It's wonderful. I'm, when I ride my bike, the energy is very high for the rest of the day. It's also cleaning the pipes on the body dashboard. We don't recommend eating heavy foods at this time of day or drinking only caffeine and then going off to work. Then you have 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the pitta part of the day, where your fire, the most useful part of your fire here is to digest food. So digestion is what we take in, how we absorb it, transit time, metabolization, usage, and elimination. It's all of that. Digestion is a, a huge process. It's not just taking in the food. So when pitta is at the highest point, in the day. It's when the sun is at its highest point also. And if there we are making really good use of our fire, we will have an undistracted and loving meal. This is one of my top three recommendations. When you wake up and when you eat. You, know, you heard me say earlier that Richard had given me this recommendation like 20 years ago when I met him. And I wasn't a quick adherent. I had to condition it for myself. But you want lunch to be the most important meal of the day and to be mindfully eaten and appreciated so your digestion is working as a whole system. And following the pitta period of the day, you have vata again. Now, this part of vata can become a liability if the other parts of the day are kind of misutilized. So in the afternoon, you can start feeling either anxious about what you didn't get done and what you still have to get done, or you can start feeling really sleepy and fatigued because the nourishment needed before then wasn't happening very well. So vata governs your nervous system and right about here, if it's out of whack, you have symptoms. Between 2 and 6 p.m. is high time for more anxiety or dread, lethargy. I recommend in this window of the day a restorative yoga pose. Like even 10 minutes putting your legs up the wall or Supta Baddha Konasana to have a time out to say I'm, I'm right now taking care of my brain, my vata, which governs your nervous system. But that's not actually one of my top three recommendations. It comes after the top three, of which you've heard two so far. Mm -hmm. After the vata afternoon, we have the kapha evening, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. This should be family time, nurturing time, a smaller meal, a more slow-paced, kind of winding down for the day, like when the farmer sits back after a long day's work and watch the sun setting over the fields and he's with his family, and like the feeling of everything is all right. Things are all good with the world. We want to have that sense as the sun's going down. We don't want to have the feeling of what I didn't get done today, what I have to do tomorrow, what I should stay up late and do right now is. To, to cultivate that kapha sundown experience, I'm, I'm recommending to my students a smaller evening meal called supper and family time, however you can manifest it, and less electronics, less direct lights from electronics on your face so that your brain actually feels like going to sleep. Or um, extra alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> That'll produce the kapha outcome too. <laughs> and then you have the nighttime pitta, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And this is where my other, my third strong recommendation comes in, that you are in bed before the pitta cycle spikes at night. 
because that pitta is meant to be taking care of you while you're sleeping. It's your janitor. It's your garbage recycling and yard debris crew. They're meant to be doing this work on your behalf. And if you have insomnia or restless sleep or you're up working with that second rush of creative fire, your janitor and your garbage and recycling and yard debris people, they go somewhere else. They feel unemployed. Or they have to try to cook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they might have to try to cook the food you're eating too late. And they're poor cooks. Yeah, they're not great cooks, right? <laughs> yeah. So the three strongest recommendations I make are when to wake up, when to eat the midday meal, and when to go to bed. After that, I can start talking to people about how they spend their evening or when they exercise or considering a restorative pose, even in their corporate environment. I can be pretty seductive, compelling, provocative for people, even in corporate environments, that there's a need for their brain and their body and for their family and their well-being. So would you like to add? Uh, that's really good. Uh, yeah. If I was going to make the top one, mm -hmm. it would be the 10 o'clock, going to bed at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Going to bed on time. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be my top one. Mm -hmm. That should promote getting up at sunrise. Yeah. And then that should promote hunger at the midday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like the, the linchpin, or whatever, the, mm -hmm. the keystone. Yeah. And in, in my experience, unless people do that, uh, unless they, they get that part right, whatever it takes, and you can't force it, but they're you know, nothing will really improve much. Mm -hmm. uh, symptoms will be stubborn. Yeah. For some of us, you need to be more careful with your sleep hygiene, including not having an extra light in the bedroom. Even the little light from your computer, they've recommended not having it. Mm. Do you know those girl bands we used to sell? They're big, they're hair bands. Do you know them, Lisa? Is that, are you wearing one now? No. But, no. <laughs> she made these really incredible hair bands. When they're open, they're about as thick as, they're, they're this wide. And then you scrunch it around to put it on your head in some way to move your hair into a fashionable statement, which I never figured out. <laughs> so I just use it to push my hair off my face when I need to. But they make really good eye masks because when you put it on, it covers your ears and your eyes and your forehead. Because even your forehead, you might have the eyes covered by the other kind of eye mask, but your forehead is taking in the light in the room, so your melatonin gets affected by that. So this is my favorite eye mask, also because it wraps the whole head, and Pitta likes that. Sometimes I tell Jay to squeeze my head, please. <laughs> no, squeeze it harder. <laughs> More. Your sweatshirt sleeve? That's a good one. And I sleep with it. Yeah, yeah. So we, comfortable. we need the dark, and we need to be feel comforted too. I'm very fond of shiradhara at night, and then go to sleep, and keep the oil in your hair and cover the mm. head. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know if this is a good time to ask about heart rate and Vata Pitta Kapha, or is that you can ask Richard? Okay. Well, I'm just curious. Like, um, I know you can listen right to the different spots on your wrist. Is that right? And if you have a certain, if you are, like I know I have a kapha heartbeat, but I wouldn't consider myself kapha. Do you have to be what your heart rate is? Or how do you? You get to be how you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like, doesn't, does it describe your dosha, your heart rate? Right. Uh, not necessarily. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, What's more important than your heart rate is your level of comfort. Hmm. So, if if you're if you push yourself to have a high heart rate, that's not good. Mm -hmm. So it's about being comfortable. 
-hmm. and and that's really what uh, anybody like to say anything that's done the heart rate training about your experience with that it's then it I was just thinking, when I, I used to be a really big time runner, and I'd go get, um, like, I don't know if heart rate and blood pressure are similar, but I'd get my blood pressure taken, and it'd be extremely slow and slow, but it's because I was in such amazing shape, mm -hmm. too. So I don't know, like, those two correlate at all with each other. But I don't think at all that I was, like, it would be kapha in a little way, right. not much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's how did you feel when you were when you were actually running? Oh, um, in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> See, it, and that's the key right there. If you're pushing yourself mm -hmm. and you don't have an experience of comfort and balance and and this what you describe bliss actually, mm -hmm. then it's it, and so it's how do you. So how do you relax into your performance? Mm -hmm. So is it used as a diagnostic tool or not? It's more you, what, what I use is I use heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Which is like, um, uh, it's the rhythm of your heart. And it's, your heart has a particular rhythm when you're relaxed and a, another rhythm when you're stimulated or mm -hmm. sympathetic, adrenaline. And that can change in a heartbeat, mm -hmm. <laughs> literally. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you adjust the Ayurveda clock for different latitudes and seasons of the year? Okay, that just makes sense yeah. to me that I that's why I said, um, in first introducing it, at the equator, at equinox, this is the timings. The, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's really um, significant because wherever you live, like, to follow the rhythm of those cycles for a full year, getting up before sunrise, going to bed like shortly after sunset. So it's earlier in the winter, later in the mm -hmm. summer, earlier getting up. That's really um, actually creates another layer of balance and resilience and um, my daughter lives in Alaska and when she first moved up there she had a friend that was a fisherman and so in the, in the summer when it's like light for literally almost 24 hours they would fish all day because you know mm -hmm. and he was very successful and then he got enough money to go to Costa Rica one winter, he came back and he could not stay awake mm -hmm. to fish. He kept falling asleep and had a miserable summer. Hmm. I was sort of wondering because it seems to me like what I felt on a day like yesterday, that that kind of siesta phase in the middle of the day should get longer. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. A little here, a little there, and then mostly resting. Yeah. But because of the culture in which I live, everyone's like, now I go camping and travel and do like a million things. Mm -hmm. And you can't understand why we're so tired in the yeah. summertime. There's almost light and we're depleted instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And by the end of the summer, everybody's pitta will be out of balance and their yeah. vata will be out of balance. And then everybody will have a real short fuse. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as fall comes, they'll all get the flu. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is the body's way of get, you know, making you get ready for winter. Yeah. So we should. Anna. Um, so I have a. I'm assuming that it also changes um, the 
period of life we're in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I guess my, my primary question is, um, is there one health promoting practice you can do during the day to encourage compliance at bedtime? Because I work with teenagers, <laughs> and I'm just wondering, like, if I were to suggest that they go to bed at 10, when their MO has been to go to bed at, like, 2 a.m., I'm wondering if there's a practice they can do to, like, prep their body to promote an earlier bedtime. Only if they want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if that, if that motivation is there. Yeah, if they, if they have a motivation, yeah. Um, well, it's, you you have to start by getting up in the morning, so it's like it's the whole rhythm of the day. Here. Uh, so you know you start on the other end. You know. I think you take them camping. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, take them out in nature and sit by the fire at night. And get up and go hiking in the morning. Yeah. I think you actually take them camping. Yeah. Uh, I know this is not in your line of work, but you may have to recommend it to families because the electronic stimulation is so big for our teenage culture right now. And those lights and the enticement of all that does keep us awake even as adults um, if we're not careful about the practice. Uh, and I also think kapha is a time in adolescence, you're in the kapha phase of life, and then you move to the pitta phase of life. And kapha, if it's been well nurtured, it's more likely to welcome guidance from older people. You're an older person to this teenager, whoever this is. Uh, but if kapha wasn't well cared for, then they move to the pitta phase of life, and the older person is giving input. Pitta wants to push back on that, like, I know what's best for me. Or their, their need for agency, or like, self-determination is stronger than their interest in hearing what you have to say. There's a, there's a book that I recommend for all of mothers. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is read the, the cover. Yeah. It's called The Seven O'Clock Bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then the, the book elaborates on all the wonderful benefits of doing that for your children putting them to bed at seven o'clock. And when you start out doing that, so that that's like, you know, so what most people do in your situation is you're trying to close the door after the horses have already got out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's, uh, so you, you literally probably just have to have empathy for them and yourself and wait until they crash and burn <laughs> because the biggest motivator for change is called pain. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say when, she, when Anna first asked you the question, I had a question for Anna which is, are you now doing that yourself? Ten thirty or eleven? We could nudge that back a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Nine thirty or ten, I would say. Okay. And so, so latitude can be adjusted there. Yeah. The reason I'm I'm asking this is I had this moment that if I was a teenager, I think I'd be less impressed by the average adult and more impressed if you were like Yoda. Well, Yoda practiced, right? <laughs> Before Luke Skywalker ever met Yoda, Yoda had like thousands of years of practice. And so if the average teenager is coming in to see the average medical provider in the average medical setting, they're probably not that interested unless they're in a lot of pain. But if that average medical provider is actually like a, an awakened Buddha in disguise, living a luminous life and making a recommendation from the lighthouse of your body, mind, psyche, it's more likely to land. I also think if you were able to slip a little bit of yoga into your appointments with teenagers, you would get more traction. That's what we do here when I see a teenager. Mm -hmm.
Oh, so you act, they're not yours, they're other people's. Yeah, she's oh, an she's an occupational worse. therapist. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. very pro when you said apropos when you said the horses have already left the barn and she they're asking her to help close the door. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I've got a book that, that I highly recommend you read. It's called Perfect Health for Kids. It's an Ayurveda book, yeah. It's yeah. really good. Could you repeat the title? I've got it in, in the office. Oh, okay. Thank Perfect you. Health for Kids. John Diard, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So I want to bring our attention to a practice of sorts, and then we'll, have, we'll be closing because we'll have to go to lunch. Um, so in the whole concept of self-nurturing discipline, one of the main teachings in yoga is the consistent cultivation of stitao. What does that stand for? What does it mean? You can't say, Carrie. What is, what is stitao? Stitao. S-T-I-T-H-A-U. Stitao. There's an equalness to it, a steadiness. Stitao. Okay, uh, sort of one-pointed. Not, I, I mean, I, you need some one-pointedness to do it. Sti stands for steady, like sama stitihi. Sama, sti, even, steady, standing. But what does tau stand for? Hmm? Kind of like ease, steady tranquility. So in the cultivation of steady tranquility, we're always asking, what would I do a little more of? What will I do a little less of? And this is abhyasa and viragyam, the concepts in the Yoga Sutras. So reducing one thing that might now be toxic to your system and nudging one thing that may benefit your system and actually doing that in tandem. Most people, when they want to change a behavior, they're thinking, what, could, what am I going to stop doing? Or they're saying, what am I going to start doing? But actually doing it in tandem makes the shift more efficiently and effectively. And so I'm going to ask you not to write down with your dominant hand all the things that you need to do less of. Think of when I say the word toxic, I mean what's a burden to your brain? What's a burden to your body? What is now burdening your life? What burdens your relationships? And I'm going to ask you to put the pen or pencil in your other hand and give yourself permission just to name three. Three things that you know you're doing too much of. Three things you're too exposed to. Three things you might eat too much of this. Three things that you know burden your brain, your body, or your life. Non-dominant. Write it with your non-dominant hand, please. It could be an action, it could be a thought, it could be a behavior. Thank you. And then in another part of your page, or not necessarily across from it, we don't know if there's a correlation or not, three things you feel would improve, three things you could do to nourish your vitality. Also with the hand you don't normally write with, three things that you feel would contribute. 
Secretary Joy, you had some words that when you were describing Papa, excluding that, and there was one that was so good, I can't remember what it was. Mm. It felt something like luscious resting or something mm. or Basking? Basking. Basking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Three things you know would contribute to your well-being. Three things that might nourish your vitality. And they're within your means to do them. Like go to Italy. Well, maybe. Now what I'd like to know is, as you were writing those things, uh, first of all, how is it to write with your non-dominant hand? Mm -hmm. Irritating? I think it's kind of fun. <laughs> Clumsy. Clumsy? I feel like I have to grab really hard. You have to hold the pencil really hard? Mm -hmm. I think it slows down. It slows things down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah? It's not getting the beginner, but I find that Space you're a beginner yeah. yeah yeah so when you're writing it with your non-dominant hand does your relationship to what you're writing change if you wrote it with your other hand would it feel different yeah. it came from a deeper place a deeper place yeah yeah I'm more connected more connected mm -hmm. You're able to be more self-critical when you write with your dominant hand, absolutely. Yeah. You also can do it more quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's more like ideas and feelings with your non-dominant hand. You have more ideas and more feelings, yeah. It's not more, you know, it doesn't come out smoothly. It's more how you feel. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's more of a symbol of what you're trying to express. Yeah, it sounds very young. It doesn't sound like my organized self. It isn't your organized self, right, <laughs> right. Now, high probability that the things you noted you could do less of and the things you noted you might want to do more of, if we were to take a little historical adventure in your life, we would see that this is not the first time those are showing up. Is that the case? Mm -hmm. For about how long have you known you should do item number two on the list of things you should do less of? Oh, Long time. Okay. And how long have you known that item number one on what nourishes your vitality would be a good idea? Like a long time. Yeah. Okay. What do you know about why it's not happening? Imbalance. Mm -hmm. the, the, the left brain is kind of in charge. Uh -huh. You know, what I learned in society. Yeah. Some conditioning, some yeah. left brain conditioning, yeah. yeah. I have, like, the, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead kind of thing going on in my brain, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> so there's a real, there's a real, you know, yeah. battle that goes on between what I know what's good for me and what I actually, you know. Yes, yeah. So there are parts of you in your inner community, there are parts of you that know the things that you wrote down. There are parts of you that rebel against those things. There are heavily conditioned parts that are following through on habitual behavior, quite likely behavior, tempo, and vibration of behavior that was cultivated in response to somebody else. So it was useful for some sort of survival or camaraderie or connection. It made sense to your brain. It's likely now outdated, but the habit is very strong. And there's a whole other part of you 
that's inspired to see what you wrote. Is that right? When you write it with your non-dominant hand, it might look a little bit more fresh because your penmanship is different. So is there a, a part of you that becomes a little bit inspired, like, oh, maybe she will do these things. Maybe he will follow through. Did that happen for some of you? Mm-hmm. A little bit maybe innocent about it also. Oh. And there's another aspect of you that's capable of advocating that this actually happens, that you follow through on what you know to be true here. I don't have time to hear all of your ideas and um, to, s- to affirm that they're good ones. In fact, some of you might have on your list there, I should run more often and faster, and I'd have to say no to that. Right. But I don't have time for hearing that and then giving you feedback about it. However, um, Laura, did you have something there? Yes. Um, rest is usually the thing that I come back to. And then I have been more intentional about it. But I have, I've struggled with like moderate insomnia throughout my life. And I get into this zone. And I go to bed at like 10 almost every night, especially during the weekend, more regular. But I'll get there and I'm like so tired and worn out and I know I need to rest and I'm in bed on time and then the anxiety comes in of why aren't you resting and mm-hmm. then I can't go to sleep for hours mm-hmm. and I don't know how to break that cycle mm-hmm. that's what's really hard for me yes okay so I hope what I'm going to say now will be uh, useful in that direction um, and we can keep exploring it so You don't actually get to know why you're not doing these very things until you change your behavior. (laughs) Because as you change the behavior, you walk into the experience that you're avoiding by not doing the things that you know you would like to do less of and do more of. Do you understand what I mean by that? So we've organized ourselves based on past conditioning for certain kinds of connection and safety and reward and prevention of disaster. And now you know something more true could happen, but you have past conditioning. And current behaviors kind of medicate the pain or distract us or numb us. And we don't get to find out what the underlying sweet spot is and all that until we start actually changing the behaviors, even small degrees of behavior change. So as you look at this list, I'm going to ask the part of you that has a, what I call an overarching life motto of kindness. I'm going to ask that part of you to just look at the list for a few moments and, and see the goodness in your ideas. To, to see and feel yourself looking at the list with the t- kind of tremendous kindness that you would feel in your belly, in your heart, and in your brain and your eyes. And to know that some of those things, when you're not doing them, you've been practicing self-abandonment. So from the part of you that has this life motto of kindness, self-kindness, seeing this list and realizing, whoa, the opposite of these, that's what I'm self-abandoning. There's probably a little heartbreak associated with that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So to the part of you that feels the heartbreak, what might the kindness have to say? To the part of you that feels that heartbreak, what would your kind part have to say? Compassion. It's okay. We couldn't do it before. And and we can do a little trying to fit now. So let's write it with your non-dominant hand, please. Maybe it's very simple because the non-dominant hand has less writing practice. What would the the overarching self-kindness part of you say (coughs) to the part that feels the loss when you're self-abandoning?
imagine that you're write, not writing a novel because it is your non-dominant hand. <laughs> And I'm going to ask you to look at what you've written and out of it to kind of distill down one or two really easy to remember words. Okay, did you get one or two words distilled down? Would some of you be willing to say what those words are? Yeah. Welcome and home. Oh, welcome and home. Mm-hmm. Did anybody get petunia as a word? <laughs> <laughs> what are some other ones that came? I went back to what you were saying in um, when you were practicing earlier, I see you and I understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really sweet for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. So thank you. Oh. Kind of yeah. Thank you for bringing that to my awareness. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So there is a very strong likelihood that if you pair your phrase, welcome home, I see you. I understand, or thank you. If you pair your phrase with the action, there is a very strong likelihood it will stick. There's also a very strong likelihood if you approach those action items with too much criticism or condescension or shame, it won't stick. You won't want to do it. If you have to go to bed on time because somebody else is imposing it on you or because your shame monster says, look, we're, we're terrible at everything, let's just get this one thing right. You probably won't follow through. But if we said thank you at bedtime to ourselves, if we said welcome home while conducting life towards that bedtime, if when we wake up in the middle of the night we said welcome home rather than, oh my God, why am I not sleeping? we might actually start changing the experience that we're having. Higher probability that this will be successful compared to how we've been trying to do it. And that your reminder phrase, whatever it turns out to be, will actually be a helpful mantra when you touch into the emotional undercurrent that you don't yet know about because these behaviors keep you away from that current. Do you follow what I'm saying there? It was a big sentence. Mm -hmm. Can you say it again, please? (laughs) The likelihood of this working, because it's not how we've been approaching it, this likelihood is greater, and the reminder phrase that you're using to help entice these behaviors to stick will be a phrase you need when your life actually starts to change and the emotional undercurrent that you can't now know when these other things are not in balance, that current will emerge. And there, your reminder phrase will come to be an aid again. It'll say compassion. It'll say, I see you, and I would like to understand. It'll say, welcome home. So let's say for Kimmy, despair emerges as she brings her life into balance, and she realizes, oh, there's like a nugget of despair that's been hanging out in there, and I don't really know what it's about, but welcome home. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So this is what we call your takeaway from today's Dharma talk. And I have kept you uh, late, so I need to to give you a lunch break and also to thank our guest students for coming and being with us and contributing with your presence here, too. And to thank Jay and Richard also for being here.
for the years of journeying together. I'm lucky to know Richard for almost 20 years now. Oh, 20 years, yeah, I moved to Portland in 1998. So how many is it? It's, yeah. Almost That's 20. It. Yeah, almost 2018. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you, everyone. We'll take a one-hour lunch break. I'll see you at 2.20.